Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. This is James Jacob Prash. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Prophecy with Moriel Ministries and RTN Christian TV. As usual, as we get closer to the American election, this tends to eclipse most other news events in the world, despite the significance of what's developing elsewhere. What we will do is try to focus on those issues after we address the election briefly. Uh, essentially, Mr. Trump is out of the hospital, thankfully, prayers of many people. But what is at stake here is something incredible. When a nation turns the way that America and other Western nations have turned, it's like God has given them over. Europe has been given over for the cost of taking care of one Muslim refugee from Syria in Europe. You could take care of a hundred Muslim refugees from Syria in a neighboring Islamic country. But yet the German government wants to import one million refugees from Syria, despite the social disorder that this has caused, as we witnessed on films of Muslims molesting German women, etc., in significant numbers. One third of the population of the sub-Saharan Africa wants to immigrate, but they don't want to immigrate to Islamic countries. They want to immigrate to Europe and to get the benefits and social benefits of living in Europe, expecting the Europeans to fund it. This is insanity. So to the United States, it is insanity. What you see happening, riots in major cities, every one of them controlled by Democrats, and in states, Illinois, California, Washington, Oregon, New York, all of these controlled by Democratic Party elected governors, state governments, every one of them. Yet people want to vote for Joe Biden for the very party that delivered that. This is insanity. Total insanity. Well, of course, they politicized the COVID virus from China as if it's the fault of Mr. Trump. In fact, if Mr. Trump handled it the way the Democratic Congress initially insisted he should, more Americans would have died, and the worst fatalities were caused in places like New York, where the state government of Cuomo forced elderly patients into institutions where they infected each other and died. How that man sleeps at night is a good question. All the grandmothers he put in their graves, be that as it may, now you have a perhaps half senile Democratic Party nominee for president who may not last, who uh, may not be compassmentous even now. He may be taking Ritalin or amphetamines or something to be able to perform in debates. I don't know if he is or he isn't, but I do know that he obviously is fumbling. He, his age is obviously catching up with him. And you have this radical woman, 
Camila Harris, who's a complete hypocrite, who slept her way to political power by having a immoral relationship with another man's, another woman's husband, Willie Brown, speaker of the legislature in California, who supported her appointment as the district attorney in the Bay Area and then as the state attorney general. As state attorney general, she imprisoned countless, countless blacks for petty crimes, while it was the Trump administration who introduced and pushed prison reforms. Yet it's Mr. Trump who's called the racist, not Camilla Harris, who acted against other blacks. Um, the way that oh, Barack Obama did the same thing with the persistent black unemployment and so forth after eight years. Nonetheless, it is a craziness. Has God given these people over to their madness? Has God given the Western world over to its madness in Europe, Britain, and America? That is a very fair question. But these things are coming to a head this week in prophecy. Please continue to pray for President Trump. We cannot endorse any political candidate, but please pray. We're told to pray for the leaders. Please pray that the forces who are for abortion and other issues of moral concern to Christians will not prevail. These things can only bring God's judgment as they did in the days of King Manasseh in Scripture. Nonetheless, let's move on. The American election as it approaches is eclipsing so much of what's happening elsewhere. Obviously, there's the ongoing political crisis in Britain and Brussels of the Brexit issue and of the complications for the relationship between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland and the fear that it would break down and see a return to the violence that preceded the Good Friday Agreement. This is highly problematic and highly complicated. Now the European Union is threatening legal action. That's only possible because of the concessions made by the British government to submit itself to the authority of the European courts. It is all absurd, but it is happening, and it is directly relevant to Daniel chapter 2, as we've mentioned on our latest teaching, is this the Fourth Reich. But let's move on to events in the Middle East and see what's really happening. This week, we have Recep Erdogan, President of Turkey, making a major announcement. Following his turning the Hagia Sophia, a Christian church that was turned into a museum, back into a mosque, symbolizing Islamic destruction, hegemony over Christianity, in offense to the small Christian population or Christianized population that lives there. Now remember, Constantinople is to the Eastern Orthodox what Rome is to the Roman Catholics. It's the seat of the Patriarch of Constantinople. I do not believe in Eastern Orthodoxy, obviously, any more than I do Roman Catholicism or liberal Protestantism, but it has a symbolic meaning in geopolitics and in Turkish politics. What is happening? Well, let's understand what is happening. This week in prophecy, Erdogan has made claims that Jerusalem belongs to the Turks. Hypocritically, he appealed to the cause of the Palestinian people. Now, during the Ottoman Empire, which he's trying to revive and resuscitate, we have to understand something. The Turks did not call them Palestinians. The Turks called them Arabs and subjugated them. They were serfs. They were a half step above a slave. They were mistreated by the Turks brutally. The kinds of things that Israel is falsely accused of doing to the Palestinian Arabs, the Turks really did. Anyone wishing to know the background can either watch the film or read the book Lawrence of Arabia on T.E. Lawrence. 
That is why the Palestinian Arabs fought with the British against the Turks. Erdogan then makes mention of the fact that most of the old city of Jerusalem, as it exists, was built with recycled stones, albeit, by Suleiman the Magnificent. And he makes reference to the fact that Turkey was driven out in the First World War when Turkey was aligned with the Kaiser's Germany. That happened without a battle. General Allenby rode through Jaffa Gate on a horse unopposed. There were stories that the Turks and the Arabs had never seen airplanes, and when British reconnaissance planes flew over Jerusalem, they became frightened, didn't know what it was. But what really took place strategically took place not in Jerusalem, but at Beersheba. The British Commonwealth forces, who were mainly ANZAS or ANZAC, Australians and New Zealands, and New Zealanders, Kiwis, underwent a defeat and a terrible, terrible military fiasco in the Dardanelles, which we know as Gallipoli. Winston Churchill suffered tremendous political harm to his career because he was one of the engineers of the British strategy to get control of the Dardanelles when he was second Lord of the Admiralty. Nonetheless, let's understand what happened. The Australians and the New Zealanders were quite angry, and they fought a fierce, fierce cavalry battle at Beersheba, soundly, soundly defeating the Turks in payback for what happened at Gallipoli. The back was broken of the Ottoman military power in the, is what is today Israel. It was largely a victory, not so much of the English British or Scottish British, but the Australians and New Zealand Commonwealth British, howbeit all under the control, ultimately, of London and of the British government, personified in General Allenby as the local commander. To the Turks, this was a national defeat. It was the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. They never recovered. What happened with the fall of Jerusalem and the defeat at Beersheba essentially was what collapsed the house of cards that the Ottoman Empire had become. Erdogan is trying to revive it, as we've said many times. Jerusalem is a symbol to him a symbol to him of having lost control of his empire to the West, who in turn, under the Belfour Declaration, gave it to Israel after the second Aliyah to Jewish refugees. Be that as it may, the Belfour Declaration was, of course, rescinded by the British, and there was a political battle and a diplomatic battle and after the Second World War, after the Nazi concentration camps had been liberated and the survivors tried to come to Israel as it was about to become, the British were putting the Jewish refugees back into camps in Cyprus. Not only did the Ottoman Empire fall, but then the British Empire quickly fell I've always believed there's a direct relationship. I'll bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. So be it. These things took place, and Erdogan, like most Muslims, has an acute sense of history. Indeed, it is a revisionist sense of history, but it's a sense of history, and it's always colored by Islamic beliefs in the doctrines of jihad, tahwid, um, hudna, and so forth. He goes on to say that the first Qibla, the Qibla is the point of focus in prayer. Today it is the Kaaba in Mecca. He states that the first Qibla was the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount, which the Koran refers to as Al-Quds, 
Only a few times is it mentioned in the Quran, and some early Islamic scholars disputed if it even mentioned Muslim. The archaeology, however, points to the fact that the first Qibla was not in Jerusalem, nor in Mecca, but most likely in Petra. So it continues. He's claiming this was the first Qibla of Islam, Suleiman the Magnificent built the old city of Jerusalem, the British took it away from us and gave it to the Jews, the Palestinian Muslims are being oppressed, etc., etc. Meanwhile, he's holding certain cards politically. The incredible number of Muslim refugees coming from North Africa, Syria, and elsewhere, some from as far away as Afghanistan, using Turkey as a avenue to reach Europe where they would massively immigrate illegally, essentially, clog the welfare rolls, demand social services, and contribute to the demographic crisis in Europe. This demographic crisis in Europe is, of course, something that is incredible. The most common male name in the United Kingdom now is Mohammed. Mohammed. Not John or Philip, but Mohammed is the most common name for newborn male babies in the United Kingdom. By the end of the present century, um, the majority of people under the age of 15 in Austria will be Muslim if this continues. Um, more British Muslims took up arms to fight for ISIS than fought in the British military against ISIS. More British Muslims fought for ISIS. Now, everyone knows this. No one can deny it. It's just politically incorrect to say it when you have a Muslim mayor of London who's basically stated that just as terror is a commonplace feature of the Muslim world, London has to get used to it being a common feature in London. To get used to the terror. It's normal. Well, it is indeed normal. It was normal in Belfast. It was normal in the Islamic world. But the Islamic mayor thinks it should be normal for London. Now, the very fact someone like this can be elected mayor is incredible. Not because he's a Asian, but because of what his views are. This is what is happening in Europe. Is this God's curse? Is this God's judgment? Well, for years I have been saying it is. In my own view, the Saudi Arabians were as responsible for September 11th as the Japanese were for Pearl Harbor. But can you imagine if Franklin Roosevelt was on Japan's payroll? when Pearl Harbor was attacked. But the Bush administration was in the back pocket of the Saudi Arabians who funded Al-Qaeda, most of the terrorists being from Saudi Arabia, and the House of Saud being the Saudi government. Yet Saudi Arabia was never held responsible. China is not being held responsible for COVID-19 because too many Western political interests, including Joe Biden, are in the back pocket of Ping's China. These nightmarish and outlandish scenarios are God's judgment. And it's the kind of insanity you read about in the book of Ezekiel. By Ezekiel's day, the warnings of Jeremiah had come to fruition. The early predictions of Isaiah were taking place, but people still rejected the reality and lived in a fantasy world even as their nation was being destroyed by the Babylonians, the way the ten northern kingdoms were destroyed by the Assyrians when the warnings of Amos and Hosea were rejected. It's unbelievable how the Judeo-Christian world, how the Western world, 
how North America are making these same errors. You've got politicians like Trudeau in Canada and, and, and Merkel handing burglars the keys to the house, bringing in people from Islamic countries who are radical, who you cannot vet. This is exactly what happened in the San Bernardino bombings in California. Adequate information and grounds for visa denial were available on the Internet, but the Obama administration with Hillary Clinton and John Kerry didn't want to violate their rights, so they were invited into California to murder Americans. Nobody holds Obama accountable. Nobody held Bush accountable. Why is this happening? It is God's judgment and God's warning. Remember 1 Corinthians 15. These things happened to them, happened to Israel, that we would learn from their mistakes. But the Judeo-Christian world is not learning from their mistakes. The Christian church is not learning from their mistakes. So-called Christians have bought into the Abraham Accords, a false peace based on a perversion of monotheism, claiming that the God of Abraham, Ibrahim, is the same God as the God of Christians and Jews, that Allah is Yahweh, which he is not. Allah is the Nabataean moon god. But let's look even further. Turkey and Israel have both furnished weapons to Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is now in armed conflict, almost an out-and-out -out war with Armenia. Israel would sell weapons to anybody who's not a threat to them unless they were pressured by the USA not to. I don't believe Israel is arming them now, but they have Israeli weapons. But the real source of weapons to this Muslim nation going to war with a Christianized nation is Turkey, is Erdogan the military support and military hardware, the weapons and munitions are coming primarily now from Turkey. Now understand this. The first empire to Christianize was not the Roman Empire. The Armenian Empire is the oldest Christian empire in the world. And although the Armenian church resembles Eastern Orthodoxy and has monophysite influences and other things of this nature. Um, we're also a number of Pentecostals. What happened in Azusa Street in California and what happened with Smith Wigglesworth in Yorkshire, in the north of England, at the same time, there were similar Pentecostal revivals taking place in Armenia. These people faced genocidal slaughter. There was an actual Holocaust slaughtering over two million Armenian Christians. Some of them born-again Christians under Pasha and the Turks. The forgotten Holocaust. There are Armenian communities in Jerusalem and Haifa living peaceably with the Jews. Nonetheless, this conflict goes back. The Turks tried to exterminate the Armenians. Now the Turks are arming Kazakhstan to fight the Armenians in a territorial dispute that goes back generations over Nagorno-Karabakh. Again, this is on the very edge of the Middle East. This is on top of the Turkish conflict with the Kurds. Let us move on. What else is happening this week in prophecy? This week in prophecy, we see more actions by Turkey. Turkish jets intercepted 
six American-built F-16s being flown by the Greek Air Force over joint military exercises and naval exercises of the USA and Greece. USA and Greece are having joint exercises, and when Greek planes try to head towards Cyprus, which is mainly Greek ethnically, the Turks prevented them at the threat of air-to-air -air combat. This is military aggression. Sooner or later, something is going to happen. Turkey has already seized 40% of Cyprus as the Sir Turkish Cypriot homeland, when in fact only 15% of the population of Cyprus were ethnically Turks, but they took 40% of the terrain. This goes on, and it's happening right now. It's happening this week. This is part of the ongoing conflict of Turkish interests with Libya as opposed to Greek interests with Egypt and Israel for the oil and natural gas deposits resources on the continental shelf that we've spoken so much about. But it's happening, and it's happening right now. Let's look further at this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the Saudi government is again pushing ahead with its plans for the Neon City. And therefore has moved perhaps a half step closer to some kind of peace with Israel. Some kind of compromise about the Temple Mount. But something else happened this week in prophecy. With Saudi Arabia, Ibrahim Hamidi, a Syrian-born so journalist in Saudi Arabia, has stated in the press that Syrian President Assad is interested in new negotiations with Israel. It is almost certain that this is a staged ploy. He cannot possibly abandon his claims for the Golan Heights, all of it. He has some of uh, Mount Hermon, thanks to Henry Kissinger. But he can't abandon it. It is simply political theater, diplomatic theater. He's trying to get the United States to ease its grip on the isolation of Syria for the human rights abuses in which hundreds of thousands of Syrians were systematically destroyed by the Syrian government, the lives of men, women, and children, and a very large percentage of Syria's Christian population were killed, were driven out of their homeland. This is what's taking place. Now, obviously, he's not interested in peace with Israel. He's interested in benefiting his economy. The economies of Turkey, Iran, and Syria are all in trouble. And they are all desperate for foreign exchange. What Erdogan is doing in Syria is blocking the illegal immigration of mass numbers of Muslims via Turkey into Europe, into Greece and Italy, in exchange for cash payment. The EU is buying him off to stop the flow of refugees and illegal immigrants. He's basically blackmailing Europe. He's basically continuing by proxy the Armenian Holocaust, or trying to. He's basically trying to outflank the Arab Muslim countries of the Persian Gulf 
and the Arabian Peninsula, as we have spoke about in our previous This Week in Prophecy. He's obviously trying to gain more control of the energy deposits, natural gas and oil, on the continental shelf in the eastern Mediterranean, in some league with Libya, and also in some partnership with Russia. Now understand what happens. Turkey is theoretically a NATO member. One NATO member scrambles planes against another while they're engaged in joint maneuvers with the United States. If Turkey is pushed out of NATO and pushed away from Europe, where is it likely to go? To Russia. Russia is also in financial trouble because it is a oil state. Apart from weapons, it doesn't have much to offer the rest of the world except for oil and natural gas. But the prices are so low and demand is so low even before COVID. Mr. Putin is financially desperate. Iran, thanks to the Trump administration's sanctions, is desperate. Certainly, Assad is desperate. And this desperation is beginning to show its hand in what is being manifested politically. We've placed a lot of emphasis on looking at Erdogan and Turkey in most of our recent prophecy podcasts and videos, <coughs> with good reason. Again, we're mindful of those who see some kind of Gog and Magog scenario formulating or configuring. We have tapes explaining our assessment of those possibilities available on our website, moreal.org. But this week in prophecy, the events taking place in the Middle East involving Turkey once again are being eclipsed because of the American election and because of the COVID crisis and because of the Brexit conflict hard exit, soft exit in Great Britain. It's not getting the intention it deserves. Well, irrespective of what happens with Boris Johnson and Brexit, even irrespective of who wins the American election, irrespective of that, irrespective of COVID-19, the events that are taking place in the Levant, in the Middle East, in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the border region between Kazakhstan and Armenia, in the Goro Karabakh. These events are going to be there and continue no matter what happens with COVID or the American election or the aftermath of Brexit. Once more, we urge people, watch this space and please pray to God that he withholds his judgment. If these pro-abortion, pro-same-sex, radically pro-same-sex marriage, political parties who are pandering to radical socialist violence to, to, to a neo-Bolshevism and a neo-Nazism. If they get power, it will have to be understood as God taking his hand off of the United States. But when he takes his hand off the United States, what happens to the rest of the world? China will walk all over everyone while they're persecuting Christians. Iran 
will be able to be revived. Remember, it was Mr. Biden who went around actually encouraging Western countries to invest in Iran as part of the Obama betrayal. These things are happening this week in prophecy. As we also see in the United States, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton were party to the criminal conspiracy to undermine the transition of power to a new presidency with Donald Trump. The corruption in the deep state with John Brennan, with James Clapper, with Stroik and, and, and Linda Lisa Page, and with Comey and with McCabe, etc. And, and Susan Rice, etc. I pray that these things are bought not only to the public, but brought to the court and indictments are issued and that trials do take place. In the interest of justice, it was an attack on democracy and democracy is something that is worth contending for. But it's disappearing, as we've been warning for years. Finally, this week in prophecy, Christy Higgs an employee of a school in England, on her own personal Facebook page, under her maiden name, objected to something happening in the school system of the state schools and the Church of England schools near Bristol, England, in Gloucester, and Gloucester, that the curriculum was going to impose teaching young children about the normalcy of same-sex marriage, homosexuality, and lesbianism, and it was being imposed without respect for the religious values of parents. And she complained, and she said this was something that was an attack on religious freedom and so forth. She was fired from her job. She took the school that employed her to a tribunal. And the tribunal ruled against her, saying her language was outrageous. This, again, is an indictment of what has become of British society. Ruth Ginsburg stood before her Messiah guilty without a hope or a plea. I very much doubt that woman was saved on her deathbed. Well, she found out who the real Supreme Court is when she gave up the ghost. I look forward to the day when these politically motivated magistrates and judges are summoned to the same court in judgment. I'd rather they got saved but that's not likely. Please, Lord, may some of them get saved. But that's not likely. Charles, I'm just recording a twip. Can I call you back in a second? Sorry, I missed. That was just Charles. <clears throat> um, very unlikely these people will repent. This is Romans chapter 1. The Lord will deal with these people. To teach that to children as normal. To violate the rights of Christian parents. To fire Christians for objecting to it. Not even in the school or on school time or during working hours, but on their own private outlet in social media. This is persecution. And it's come to Britain, and it's come to America, and it's certainly come to Australia. Persecution is coming, but so is Jesus. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless.
For more information about Moriel, check out our website www.moriel.org.